After Matthew Perry's tragic death may have been ruled an accident, but that doesn't mean criminal charges are off the table. We'll explain what may happen as a result of an ongoing investigation, and we'll discuss with certified interventionist and drug treatment counselor, Ken Seeley. Welcome to Sidewalk, presented by Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. an interesting report regarding the death of actor Matthew Perry. Now remember, it was back in October of 2023 when the 54-year-old Friends star was found dead in his jacuzzi out in LA. Now officials indicated this was an accidental death that was caused by the acute effects of ketamine. There was also contributing factors of drowning, coronary artery disease, and a synthetic drug that was used to treat opioid use disorder. Now, the coroner indicated that the ketamine levels in his body were so high that it was equivalent to what patients receive as anesthesia during surgery. It is such a tragedy thinking about what happened to Matthew Perry, and we know that Perry had been battling substance abuse for years, and at the time of his death, he was reportedly clean for 19 months, but apparently he had been undergoing ketamine infusion therapy. This was apparently to treat depression and anxiety. And to be clear, this is a death that has rocked not only the entertainment community, but frankly, the entire world. Perry was beloved. Just to give you an example, the Friends cast in the wake of Perry's death, they issued a joint statement saying they were all so utterly devastated by the loss of Matthew Perry that they were more than just castmates. They were a family. Well, now it is being reported that those who supplied Matthew Perry with the ketamine could be criminally charged. Last month, the LAPD announced that they were working alongside the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, to determine how Perry got the drug. In fact, it's been reported that the U.S. Postal Inspection Service is also a part of this probe. This is a federal investigation. It is ongoing. Now, a law enforcement source recently told People that this probe is nearing its conclusion and that multiple people should be charged. Not that they will be charged, but should be charged. Now, we can't independently verify the status of this investigation or this comment, but it is interesting to note it. The source did indicate that the decision on whether to move forward with any charges will ultimately be left to the U.S. attorney. They actually responded no comment to people. But I want you to think about that for a second, because if this is true, this would not be the first time that something like this has happened. I'll give you an example. This past April, a federal jury convicted a California drug dealer who sold counterfeit pills that were actually fentanyl that resulted in the overdose death of a man. So when we talk federal charges, we could be talking conspiracy or distribution. On the state level, homicide charges could be on the table. For example, just recently, a man was convicted out in Oregon for manslaughter after selling fentanyl lace pills to a teenager that ended up dying. Late last year, a California man was convicted of murder for drug-related death. So obviously the circumstances matter, but in terms of charges, we kind of have an understanding of what we might be looking at. And there is an investigation by the LAPD too. And by the way, reportedly one of the people questioned by police has been actress Brooke Mueller, actor Charlie Sheen's ex-wife. Apparently. They seized her iPhone and her computer. The reporting goes that she had met Perry in rehab, and a source told In Touch how the two formed a, quote, unexpected friendship. So with all that in mind, I want to give some perspective on this from not an attorney, not a member of law enforcement, but somebody else. I'm joined right now by Ken Seeley. He is an interventionist. He's the founder of Ken Seeley Communities and Intervention 911, and he's appeared on A&E's Intervention Show since 2005. He himself has been sober since July 14th, 1989, so he understands the complexities and difficulties of recovery. Uh, Ken, thanks so much for coming on, and thank you so much for the great work that you do. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. A great Absolutely. topic. Yeah, I mean, what are your thoughts on this, the idea that law enforcement is essentially trying to find Matthew Perry's killer in a way? Yeah, well, I like what you said, you know, earlier, like there there has been cases already that have um, police have taken action on and, you know, arresting these people that are selling the drugs and killing these people because, you know, it's one thing to sell drugs, you know, and there's another thing to sell drugs and knowing that fentanyl, especially in today's world, is killing so many people, like 300 people a day. So there needs to be a consequence. You know, as an interventionist, 
there needs to be a consequence to stop the people that are doing this in order to slow down the death rates that we're experiencing in this country. And to be clear, this wasn't always the case, right? It was the people who were supplying it that ended up in a death. They weren't always criminally charged, right? No, I mean, it goes back as far as Michael Jackson. Remember his doctor, you know, got right. charged and got, you know, had to do jail time. But, you know, it, it really needs to. And it even went back to the 80s. They tried it in the 80s, but it didn't really work. But it wasn't about it was causing death at that time. Today, it's causing death every single day. Like yeah. fentanyl is killing people every single day in this country. It's, it's awful. It's awful. It, it's really... Yeah. Um, such a plague on this country, and I, I don't see a solution uh, on the horizon. But talking about ketamine for a second, uh, walk us through yes. that. Um, what should we know about ketamine? How often is it used? Why is it used? You know, ketamine, you know, God, has been around for years. I used to do it when I was doing drugs, you know, it'll be over 35 years ago. And um, so it's been around for many, many years. And you know, it's a horse tranquilizer where it just numbs you out. Like, I, I didn't like the effects that it had on me when I did it. I, I still remember one time when I did it at a club, I couldn't even walk. I couldn't talk. I just had to sit in a corner for a long time um, to come out of it. So the effects are pretty dramatic. You know, if you're, you know, a hardcore heroin addict or fentanyl addict, ketamine seems to work really well. It's in the same family. It kind of like just numbs you and just takes you out of feeling. But that's the recreational use, like I used it at. And then they have the medical use that has been very effective for many people today, where it helps with, you know, um, depression, anxiety, um, things like that, where a professional will sit you down, as they were talking about, that might that um, that he went through, right? A professional sits you down, they have you in your office, they give you a dose of ketamine and they work through, you know, your anxiety. They work through these symptoms that you have in order to break through them. And it seems to work for a lot of people. You know, I have a relative that did it and he didn't like the effects, but I think it might've worked at some level. So. It's, it's been effective by the medical community um, and a lot of my colleagues, but for recreational, it's similar, not as bad as fentanyl where it's killing people as quickly, but as we see here, it did. And it was also the circumstances of where Matthew Perry was uh, when he was on this, you know, the jacuzzi. Um, the ketamine trade, though, if they're looking into where it was supplied from, is it different than fentanyl? I mean, where, who supplies it? Where is it sourced out of? No, that's the same thing. You know, that's when I was getting it on the streets 35 years ago, it was, you know, you could get it there and, you know, now you could get it from your doctor. But again, only if you are being seen by the doctor and you're with the doctor. I think a doctor um, was under investigation or the DEA stopped them for prescribing at home use fentanyl. So, uh, or not fentanyl, I'm sorry. Um, ketamine so i think that has already happened in the in the recent past so if you're in a controlled environment and it's done for that reason you know and it is helping people then great but if it's being recreationally used and selling on the streets then we got to do something to put an end to that so we're not losing so many people and people are dying from this I had mentioned that uh, Brooke Mueller um, has this connection, apparently developed a friendship in rehab with Matthew Perry. Um, reportedly, they leaned on one another. Now, again, to be clear, she has not been criminally charged with anything. We know that law enforcement has spoken with her. So I, I want to be very clear about that. Um, but in your experience, when um, individuals are in rehab, do you see at times that that can be a source for where one um, you know, rebounds or one where uh, uh, drugs can be shared uh, down the line, you know, because that relationship of two people uh, in rehab is something I think interesting to explore uh, when you hear that development, right? Yeah, I mean, I, you look at that, but then you look at the other side, you know, I, I still know a lot of people that I, you know, was in treatment and sober living with from 35 plus years ago. So, I mean, it's, it's a double-edged sword, but you, I, yes, I absolutely heard of people meeting people in rehab and then going out and relapsing together. So that's that's also common. So 
the hope is that you take the, the, the peers that you meet in rehab and you use them as a crutch to get into your recovery. But yeah, it goes both sides. So I don't know the relationship between the two of them. So I don't really, you know, can't speak to that. But um, I've seen it where it goes both ways. I, I thought it was interesting that law enforcement had reportedly uh, seized her phone and her laptop, her, her computer. I'm imagining for any sort of communications, right? I mean, in typically speaking, uh, do you see these kind of communications when, when people are trying to obtain drugs or sell drugs? I mean, how does that, what, should we, what do you think law enforcement might be looking for there? Yeah, that's probably it. Just what kind of communications they had regarding any drug activity or anything like that. And, you know, and it's such a hard one to really put your finger on because I'm, I'm the, I'm the, I come from the mindset of consequential thinking. You know, when I do an intervention, it's about the consequences that motivate people. I think I heard, you know, um, Ben Affleck talked to Howard Stern on his show once about, you know, it was the pain that motivated him from his kids seeing him differently that got him into recovery this time. And, um, and it really takes that kind of pain, that discomfort. So the consequential thinking is where, you know, my model is from, like what I do. And so I could see that being proactive, but then on the other side is the person buying the drugs knows the effect, they're an adult, they know what the consequences could be. Um, so it's like that double-edged sword, right? Do you, do you go after the person that you got it from or does the person that purchased it and got it and used it um, as a consulting adult, you know, is, do they hold up the, reli the liability on that? So it's very delicate, but I, I really believe there has to be some form of consequences in order, especially, you know, this is, you know, we're talking about ketamine, but fentanyl is the number one killer as drugs out there right now. And it's similar and people are dying quickly and we need to respond quickly with something that's gonna motivate people from stop selling them, stop getting the drug, whatever it's gonna take. We gotta do something to get in front of it. A couple of things to, to note there. Um, to, to backtrack one second about Brooke Mueller, I mean, again, just to make it really clear, not suggesting that she has any role in this uh, whatsoever. Um, and and yeah. when you talked about uh, fentanyl, right, obviously a lot of the cases are where people buy a certain product and they don't realize it's laced with fentanyl. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's why you can have this kind of criminal liability. With ketamine, something interesting that you said that it made me wonder, do people realize the, what the effects are on the body of it? I mean, do people realize the danger of too, taking too much ketamine or is it that's something that's not widely known, it's not widely circul circulated, there's not a, an education about ketamine as much as there is about fentanyl? Yeah, no, good question because, you know, there isn't. You're absolutely right. There isn't a lot of education out there about uh, ketamine. And, you know, if you look at the death rates out there in the country, there aren't very many people that die from a ketamine overdose. So that's why it's not as public. Um, it's pretty rare, you know, you usually just go into this hole of, you know, into, you know, you're kind of like paralyzed. And like you said earlier, the reason why it ended up killing him, it wasn't that he overdosed on it, he pretty much drowned. He was in a jacuzzi and he didn't have his, his mobility and the functions to be able to get out. Like I said, when I was on it in the past, you just, you, you just freeze and you can't move and you're you're stuck in your own body without being able to make it function. Right. So for something like that to happen, you know, in this horrible situation that it did with Matthew Perry, you know, being in a jacuzzi, it was just, you know, not the norm. People aren't usually in a jacuzzi when they're doing ketamine. And I would say from a legal point of view, whoever, if anybody does get charged, one of their defenses would be this was not foreseeable, right? We, we didn't anticipate uh, right. you know, that you supply somebody with ketamine, that they would take it in a position where they'd end up drowning uh, in a jacuzzi, like it'd be different than a fentanyl case. So again, just uh, speculating what a legal case might look like. But going back to Matthew Perry, and, and I wanna go back to him because you know, like you, you have to applaud um, him being sober for, for a significant period of time, um, and, and it seemed by all accounts he was going to try to continue uh, to be sober. Um, 
walk me through the struggles. Walk us through the struggles of what that's like for somebody in Matthew Perry's position to fight that. Um, you know, you have firsthand experience on it. Um, what is that like? Um, I, I think it's really difficult, especially for the celebrities out there with the uh, endless resources of finances, you know, their, their uh, platform that they have. Um, it's really, really, really difficult because, um, like I said, in order for anyone to stop and all the years, I still go to recovery, I still go to meetings and, you know, there's a thing out there where they talk, people say what it was like before they got sober, what happened and what it's like now in recovery. And I always listen to the what happened, what happened, what motivated them to get them to shift and change and get into recovery. And it's always consequences. And when you have, you know, unlimited or a lot of resources financially and you have fame and fortune and all these other things that add to it, it's kind of hard to hit consequences. You know, it's hard to, because if somebody puts consequences into your life, um, you kick them out of your life and you get the yes people in your life. So for him to get sober, I, I think it's really, really, really difficult. It's one of the hardest things. And, and I, like I said earlier, I love the way, um, you know, Ben Affleck told Howard Stern is it was the pain of seeing his kid's face, the way they, they reacted to him. That's the kind of pain, but I've seen some mothers walk away from their kids and their addiction. So it's not the same consequence for everyone, but it's the suffering and the pain that motivates people to get into recovery. And that's what my job is as an interventionist is to create that pain, create that discomfort in a loving, respectful way that's gonna motivate them to get into long-term recovery. So if, you know, I never met him or I was never involved with him, you know, in any of his treatment, but that's what it would take is to figure out what the motivator is and then keeping that consistent to get him into long-term recovery. So he was there. It's just that it's so heartbreaking to see those interviews with him when he was doing so well and now losing him. And again, this was an accident. This was an accidental death. And so, um, you know, we have to make that clear. He seemed to be on the path to even uh, greater things. And it's such a sad case. It's a tragedy. And, you know, Ken, before we go, I, I, I was, first of all, again, highlighting the great work that you do. Congratulations on your sobriety. If anybody's struggling out there, if anybody is in need of recovery, if anybody knows anybody in need of recovery, Ken, what are the resources they can go to? Where, where should they turn? Besides going to you, of course. Yeah, I mean, I, there's so many things. Like, I love it when people say, you know, um, treatment's only for the wealthy, right? You know, oh, if I had money, I could go to treatment. There's so many treatment options out there, you know, that are state-funded, government fun There's so many options. You know, I would say if you're out there suffering and you need help or a loved one needs help, pick up the phone and don't stop calling until you get your answers. Until you get a solution, don't stop calling because you're going to find somebody on the other side that's going to be able to help you. You just got to pick up the phone and do the work because without doing that, there's no hope. Well, Ken, thank you again. Hopefully we can uh, get this message out there. It can help people save some lives um, because you're doing great work and keep up the good work. Ken Seeley, thanks so much for coming on to talk about this. Thank you. All right, everybody, that's all we have for you right now here on Sidebar. Thank you so much for joining us. And as always, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. I'll speak to you next time.